Welcome to Off Grid Path and this is going to be a over an hour long narrated film of the whole cabin build where we built a cabin uh, in the UK and converted a rundown static caravan into a dream cabin for us. So I appreciate that isn't for everyone but for us it certainly was. So the aim of this video is basically to give you the narrated version so my kind of take on each process of the build and what we learned and what we did wrong and what was good and what was bad um, and talk about how we got the land um, kind of go through how much things were where we tried to cut costs um, and kind of go through all of that really uh, I thought it would give people a pretty good insight in case it was something you were thinking about doing yourself um but yeah let's get started so um with the cabin when we first arrived and looked at the cabin uh it was in a really bad state um and that, that's an understatement the all of well most i'd say about 80 percent of the windows were smashed through um that's fine that's fairly aesthetic you can get windows to replace all of that but structurally the cabin was in a pretty dire state um you can see the wall here on the top right of the screen was actually bowed completely um, and I don't think it would have survived the winter when we started the build it was uh, about September and I think another winter uh, that would have caved in um, the whole thing was flexing and nothing supporting it whatsoever um, caravans it turns out are actually really flimsy things um, we found out once we started taking the walls down and things like that even the hardboard on the walls is is, is kind of works uh, as a structural entity to the cabin so everything in the cabin kind of creates the stiffness so it's a really interesting learning curve doing this uh, one thing to point out is uh, if you if you're thinking oh you know I'd love to do that but I don't have any experience in in renovating or carpentry or anything like that to reassure you um, we didn't have any experience whatsoever uh, it was uh, the, I mean wh and when I say that I'm not exaggerating I had zero experience in in any carpentry or DIY um, always actively avoided it always thought it was a bit of a dark science so this was very much out of our comfort zone um, and everything we learned uh, was mostly I'd say 90% of it was through YouTube it was just very much you get to one stage um, and this is a perfect example actually the windows um, never replaced a window and we did you know researched it all on YouTube and actually it's a very simple thing to do I always thought replacing windows double glazing like that you know the, the PVC style windows was actually a, a really difficult thing to do it's not it was incredibly simple um, and that was probably the first time in the renovation that um, I had this kind of epiphany that I was like oh my god this is great and it was a very empowering um, point of the renovation right at the start where it's like okay windows brilliant I've learned now how to change a PVC window which obviously doesn't sound like a huge deal but to me it was it was a big big thing so um, once we kind of measured up the windows we wanted to just see what was uh, in the roof so we punched through this hardboard in the roof and to our surprise we found that um, we had some rafters and there was a big air gap in the, in the roof so that the insulation before was just resting on that hardboard and I am six foot five so for me to have a high roof um, was really important so this was a really lucky find um, to have these rafters and as soon as we pulled this roof down we were like great that's the jackpot you know we can we can now have this kind of lounge kitchen area a lot higher and obviously you know we're dealing with a 40 foot static home caravan mobile home I'm not sure what you what the difference is or what you would actually call it a static home I guess or mobile home um, and it's very small so uh, you know it's about eight to nine foot wide um, 
you know, so it's quite a small area. So to be able to lift that ceiling up makes it, you know, gives that uh, a feeling that it's a lot bigger than it actually is. Um, in between some of the, uh, the, the building work, we kind of uh, got to work on the garden, just cutting back some um, fallen trees and cutting back some brambles and things like that and found some quite nice areas um, that were just completely overgrown. Um, so we thought we'd just sort of give that a go one day just to try and cut cut back and, and see what was there. And it was quite nice. We opened up a huge section to, uh, relatively huge section to, to the garden. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's very much um, learning as we're going. So we would start the renovation. We had a vague idea of what we wanted, but it was kind of working it out as we go. So whatever problems we were presented with, it was straight onto Google straight onto YouTube and kind of figuring out, um, you know, how to do it. And there is always a video, which is the amazing thing about YouTube, always a video to show you how something is done. So the first thing we, we did was rip down some of the walls um, and replace the glass uh, with the window. So we had to obviously pay for that, the, the, the new glass, because it's specific measurements for, for the window. So we had to order that. The second thing, once we started tearing the walls down, we realized how flimsy uh, the, the caravan actually was. So we've got these acro props, which are used to just support um, the building structurally, um, because that wall was completely flimsy. And as we took the hardboard off, we realized that actually the hardboard was, was quite a large portion of, of structurally holding everything together. So the acro props came in just for safety to, to hold that wall up. Um, that was going to be a temporary thing um, until we decided how to kind of brace that wall. So with the wall, uh, we decided to, we had a quite a lot of um, scrap wood. Um, so we decided to do a stud wall um, on, on that side of the wall. Initially, you can see Faye there pushing the wall back to kind of get it in place. Put the, made the stub wall putting a bit of wood on the bottom and then um, building up from that and that uh, was the heftiest bit of wood in the in the static home by far so it felt solid after that you know that that wall felt like it was really solid um, one of the things here with the with the door this is the main entrance at that one end um, this is actually on the the east side of the cabin um, we decided that we wanted to move the doors and uh, we thought that was going to be a huge job and it was a huge job but surprisingly easy again it was one of these things that you think oh god how, how do you move doors and then install doors but one of the beauty beauties of, of, of doing this renovation or something like this is whatever you do to it whatever you add to it you're going to be making it stronger because it's quite a flimsy uh, thing anyway so we basically cut out this aluminium shell um, and place the door um, there. So we wanted to be able to walk into the kitchen rather than walk into the lounge. We wanted, we knew we wanted the lounge to be kind of closed off and cozy. We we're going to have a log burner in there. And if we didn't move the door, the only place we could put the log burner was in front of the window. So we wanted the log burner in the corner. Um, so yeah. that was a that was a really good move in the end. Um, um, we acquired this log burner uh, from a friend and it was free. So this is a 10.5 kilowatt burner, um, which is quite a hefty burner, especially for the size of the cabin and the space that it's heating. It's, it's easily two or possibly three times more powerful than you actually need it to be in terms of heat output. So but it was free and we were on a budget so we decided to kind of renovate it was in a state of disrepair so we decided to try and uh, do that up a little bit so we got some stove paint spray gave it a good scrub down with some uh, wire brushes got this stove paint spray online which is just this kind of matte black obviously fire proof um, stove paint specifically for stoves and we re-sprayed the stove immediately looked 
much better. Um, you know, almost look brand new if you didn't look inside. And spray painted all of the little parts as well, like the the, the dials for the vents and things like that. Um, and the doors, and then we, we kind of fitted the doors, just checked everything worked. Um, so that, that was actually really great. Um, to be able to do that for the stove. Like I said, the stove was free. Um, and we did have to buy the flue. Well, that did, <coughs> it did come with, with some flue, uh, some flue pipe, uh, but it was old and we thought we wanted to get twin wall flue for that. Um, it's worth checking out the full kind of stove uh, refurb and install video that I've done. And I'll do a bit of narration for that as well because I'll go into that in a lot more detail and how, how we kind of um, solved the installation and things because we did that all ourselves. So it was quite a lot of research involved in that. So there's the, the roof, which is great. Um, we're now sort of really making some progress um, with the build, every, you know, they've got that kind of lounge kitchen area quite gutted um, and starting to think about reinforcing the walls. At this point we had some high winds and some of the walls are really shaking. So it was probably a stupid way to do this but what I did was pull out this internal wall um, making the entire structure extremely um, weak uh, but it was only going to be for a short amount of time uh, because I knew that I was going to put up a stud wall um, a central stud wall so at this point um, when doing the stud walls we definitely had a good idea on where we wanted the bedroom where we wanted the bathroom shower rooms kind of toilet um, so I knew where the sort of central stud wall separating the bedroom, the hallway, and the shower room was, was going to be placed. This um, static home to begin with uh, was it's classed as a two bedroom static home. Uh, when they say that, it's obviously very um, exaggerated. You know, the one bedroom was actually a fairly decent size. I mean, you'd fit a double bed in there and it would pretty much take up the entire room. Um, but the other bedroom was tiny. So what we decided to do was actually use that second bedroom just for the bed. And I'll show you that later on in the video when you'll, when you'll see it and we kind of um, open up the, the floor. So as you can see here, I've done the, the midway stud wall, um, or started it at least. Um, that added was a lot stronger than, than what was there before, what you saw me just tear down. So now, as we're making this stud wall for this, for this static, every little bit of wood that we're putting on is you know, 10 times stronger than whatever was there before. So we're really adding a lot of stiffness and a lot of strength to the cabin. Um, and yeah, it was at this point where I was like, right, this is great. This is really making this cabin solid. Um, one thing to bear in mind, this was a mobile home. Um, so maybe that is a difference between static and mobile homes. It was on uh, a frame and it was on wheels, um, but there was no chance of it moving anywhere. The, the kind of chassis or the wheels had definitely kind of rusted a bit. It definitely wasn't roadworthy. Um, it was n never going to be intended to move anywhere. Um, so I just want to point out that everything we're doing now is not you might be thinking, wow, you know, you guys are adding a lot of weight to this. You're never going to be able to move it. But the plan was to never move it. This was going to be pretty, well, it is permanent. You're never going to move that um, without completely taking it down. So there was no worry there in terms of, of weight, um, that's for sure. Uh, so we could just kind of add what we wanted to it without the worry of thinking that we'd have to, you know, tow it somewhere. It was always going to be in situ. So here we're um, just doing a bit with the flooring. I didn't take up the entire floor, but just took up a few bits that seemed a bit kind of rotted. Did kind of evaluate the, the whole floor. Laid a bit of um, this eco um, insulation down um, and just put a bit of OSB um, chipboard down for the, for the floor. But like I said, the whole floor wasn't replaced. Just bits of it were replaced. So you can see me opening up here, this is Vicas Fireboard. Um, this is what people use if they don't have a stone um, fireplace 
uh, for insulation. It's a fireproof board that people use to put around the log burner to protect heat transfer into the wall. But you can also use it for inside the log burner. So because we had a 10.5 kilowatt burner, I wanted to extend the life of it. Obviously, it's been used. So I lined it with this Vicast fireboard. Um, the reason for that is one, to extend the life of the burner, but also it will reduce the output. You're, you're reducing the space inside, but that didn't matter to us because it was 10.5 kilowatts. So I don't know what the, the mass would be um, to, to you know, how much it reduced it by, uh, but it doesn't matter. It, you know, it, it is such a big burner for the space. You know, I could have probably put three times as much fireboard in there and it would still be um, running super hot in there. Um, so that it was more for us, it was more to extend the life. We also put a bit of the, um, replaced the uh, fireproof rope um, uh, for the for the doors and that's kind of acts as the, um, uh, yes, yeah, so no, no smoke or anything can come out. I'm using the same Vicast fireboard here um, to basically protect the the heat transfer uh, running into the walls because obviously there's a lot of wood we're in a caravan if that catches fire everything goes you know there's probably no chance of being able to put it out the fire would spread too quickly to even keep up with um, I put these these uh, little backing boards here just uh, scrap wood really um, just to act as a bit of an airflow so there was a gap behind um, but these fire boards work really well at not transferring heat so they when the heat's kind of put on them, it will not transfer to the other side. But we just put an air gap in there just to make sure. Um, and again, a lot of this was overkill. We did a lot of research into um, how to best, uh, you know, make a stove safe in a caravan or anywhere um, where there isn't, uh, you know, a stone fireplace or a stone hearth. Uh, so that's the that fireboard is what we came up with you can see the top of the burner there we actually ended up putting um, uh, twin wall flue and I'll go on to that in in a minute um, but as you can see here I'm starting to measure out the wood um, for the hearth and this is basically going to surround the um, the stove and eventually you're going to fill that with concrete and it was about three to four inches of concrete we poured in the end um, again looked at looked at getting kind of slate hearths and things like that um, which would have been fine um, but quite difficult to find one to fit that corner so it would have just been a kind of odd shaped hearth really in that corner so we decided to completely um, concrete that um, that whole corner just I guess just for um, just to be able to have it neater rather than just have a, a bit of slate in there and then um, yeah that kind of worked better for us in that instant so so that is the stove kind of refurbished there put the handle back on and the glass in um, and now pulling the stove out to be able to then start pouring concrete I know nothing about concrete, um, but a good friend of mine does. So he told me to just um, put a bit of PVA glue in the in the base just to give it something to to uh, bond to. Um, and then a good friend of mine who knows a lot about concrete came and helped me uh, mix some concrete. Um, so we mixed that concrete. Um, he also put a bit of these kind of fiberglass. Um, uh, scraps in there which kind of really make it a lot stronger and bond it so uh, he actually finished this off I tried but um, I, I just did not have the, the technique to do it so he gave it a really nice finish uh, bringing all that kind of fatty liquid up to the top and then we just let that cure for a couple of days um, and then came back in a few days to check the progress and it was solid so it's a very exciting time um, because winter is drawing in it's very cold in the cabin there's no insulation there at all because we ripped it all out um, so the only heat we were ever going to have to the cabin was going to be the log burner 
Uh, so, you know, uh, it was a big kind of um, big stage installing the log burner. That was kind of a big uh, landmark for this 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 whole build. Um, so the research that we did was was pretty sound and we're happy with what we're going to do. We got that twin wall um, flue and we had to buy that brand new because I didn't want to mess around with with that I wanted something good quality the reason we went with twin wall is just for that again that safety I didn't want single wall running all the way up just in case of heat so we really went overkill on each on each process there um, on each section of the burner with the hearth and the fireboard making sure that was nice and high and then twin wall flue running up um, just so it wasn't pumping out loads of heat like a single uh, wall flue was First time I've ever drew, drilled through a roof and it's uh, quite a frightening feeling. You've just got to go for it. There's no uh, way around it. And it's just, a, it's just quite an alien concept to just drill through a waterproof roof. But first hole went in and then it was just a case of you're committed then. So, so just got to trust that, you, that you've kind of done your research and you're doing things right. Um, but yeah, it turns out the roof I thought were actually tiles, but it's not, it's kind of a, an aluminium metal um roof to make look like tiles very simple uh so kind of easy to cut through i just got a a metal cutting jigsaw um piece and went to town on that so now we're connecting the whole flue through the roof um and i did actually have another piece to go on top but i thought actually do you know what that's our predominant winds are are westerly um, so there's no kind of threat with having enough airflow there. I did think I might have needed to go a bit higher, but actually it turns out that the drawer of the burner was great. So we just put the flashing on. Um, that was very simple, probably overdid it with the screws, but I thought more is better than less. Um, so that was great. And then just built a, um, uh, just used a little bit of chicken wire. Um, this obviously didn't come with the, with the flu but I just wanted to use that as a bit of a um, uh, just to stop birds trying to nest in there any wildlife trying to nest in there so I just used a bit of chicken wire to wrap around a couple of times um, just around the, the the top of the burner um, and once that was on top that was basically it you know then it was just a case of is this going to work you know you've done everything done all the research and you've done everything that you think um is right but obviously i've never done this before so it came down to the first the first light of the burner which was a huge milestone in our journey and it was a great feeling uh one to get this far and two to know that we've got heat uh, which was just brilliant, which meant cups of tea. Um, and it meant, you know, coming in on those cold mornings was uh, a lot more bearable, bearable. We also, you know, burners are fantastic for being able to dry out a room. They suck the moisture out of everything. So, you know, we knew that this cabin had been sitting there for a long time. And I knew that once it got gutted, we wanted to get the burner in first because I wanted that on most days so it could really have time to dry out the cabin before we started putting walls and things up. Um, so that was great. You know, it was a really good aid in completely drying out the cabin just in case there was any damp or anything like that, you know, uh, because it hadn't been used in such a long time. Now the burner was in, it was time to go full speed on the rest of the cabin so started putting a bit of flooring down using some of this osb um, which was good easy to work with it's probably not the nicest stuff but um, at the time it was cheap and available um, yet yeah, you can use ply and things like that which probably be nicer but you know it's it's working with um, you know we're working on the budget basically uh, we didn't we did have a plan but it was very much also working things out and things changing as as you know as the the build developed so we were very much open to we weren't 100 percent. we had an idea of what we wanted but we weren't 100 percent set on that uh so that that we could remain open to any change that sort of came about and we weren't 
you know, stubborn to think, no, nope, that's how it's going to be because things do change. You know, you, you, you get your measurements wrong or something doesn't work or, you know, so we definitely remained um, open to all of that. Uh, our dog was very much part of the build um, and he just had a blanket for quite a while. So we decided to stop work and just make him a little bed um, just so he was comfortable. He loved the fire and he also loved his new bed. So it was a that was nice. He'd had his, he's had his, his place to, to relax while we were doing the work. So he was nice and warm and cosy. So yeah, wood. Wood was a um, big thing. This was how we were gonna heat the cabin from here on in. So it was nice to get the first proper batch of of wood delivered and stacked and uh, it was going to be interesting to see how much we were going to go through it um so that was nice you know if you actually it's it's first time i've ever had wood delivered because i've never lived in a place where i've had to order wood for a burner um and when it arrives you actually feel quite um wealthy you know because it, you've got this kind of tangible thing it's a really nice thing it's tangible physical thing that is going to be your heat source it's quite interesting uh, so here we are just um, battling the side of the cabin that was for down the line uh, we wanted to do it then because we wanted to just know where we were going to be drilling into if we needed to drill into anything from the inside we wanted to be able to fix it onto a bit of batten um, from sorry drilling the batten from the outside we wanted to drill on to something solid on the inside not just the aluminium sheeting so we had to put that batten on now rather than later for cladding the outside while the walls were empty on the inside if that makes sense so before we started putting the walls on um, we wanted to know where we were drilling the batten into uh, and i decided to just make a couple of stairs because we were using an old the old microwave that didn't work that was in the cabin before uh, as our step so we decided to put some proper steps in um, which actually made a huge difference and i don't know why we didn't do this earlier we were it's amazing what you get used to um, you know just stepping on a i don't know how many times we stepped on that microwave as a step but it is amazing what you just get used to and Put up with but actually having steps was just fantastic it made a huge difference and it's something that we definitely should have done earlier um, one of the really nice things is waking up early coming up to the cabin you get these lovely not every day but you do get some lovely mornings and now we're in a nice routine where we can just light the fire in the morning start warming the cabin up have a cup of tea outside in the sunshine and um have a bit of fun with the catapult so there yeah when they when you get those nice weather days it's just lovely driving there before the sunrise and getting there um, and just enjoying that little bit of time before starting work for the day uh, so things are starting to get a bit colder now um, the cabin obviously doesn't have any insulation but the log burner has made a huge difference so a lot of this build was, was trying to get things for free um, and do it as cheap as possible. Like I said, we were definitely on a budget. Um, so little things like this, this is a, a solid shower tray um, that we got for free. And because of the way we were doing things, we could just literally make the shower around that. So we get this free um, tray, which got cleaned up. And then we'd put that in the shower room and kind of mark where the shower was going to be and we could butt a wall straight up to that um, so we're starting to insulate the walls as well as we go any any wall piece that goes up of osb there'll be the rock wall you know eco insulation behind that as well um, so this is eventually going to be the shower room uh, we don't we don't have a, an extractor fan, so we put the shower basically right next to a window, um, so we could pretty much have the window open the entire time just to keep the airflow in there, not let it get too damp. Um, so that was uh, uh, going to be good. So now insulating all of the walls, it's a horrible thing to do. You get quite itchy for a couple of days. I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. 
I don't think rock walls as bad as it used to be kind of 40 years ago, but it still gets pretty itchy. Um, but you can really tell the difference as soon as we started patching up the walls with insulation, you know, it started to retain some heat. You still got no insulation in the roof, so everything's obviously escaping up there. But it's amazing how much you, you can feel the cabin warm up as you're insulating it. Uh, it's really nice to see the OSB going up because it actually really kind of, you know, we got so used to having that kind of empty wall with little bits of thin cladding there. Uh, little bits of thin kind of stub wall um, but to get the osb up it really starts to take some shape uh, everything looks a bit neater it looks like it's starting to form a, a cabin and you're getting an idea of space then so i'm just drilling the uh, drain hole for the shower um, and that's where we're going to put the shower tray over the top of that drain hole um, and that will eventually go to a soak away so all of the um, uh, the toilet system which you'll see uh, down the line and any uh, grey water like that will go into the soak away so every kind of thing we're using will be uh, kind of eco-friendly uh, non-chemical you know uh, soaps and washing liquid and things like that so I'm using that tray there uh, the shower tray to um, put the wall in uh, so I've put the shower tray in and I've basically measured where the wall's gonna go. It's gonna butt straight up to that shower tray so I can make everything super watertight around it. Um, so it's basically, a, oh, a, this is gonna be a kind of screen wall. Um, didn't really need insulation, but I thought we had a load of insulation. I may as well put it in. Um, I don't think it's ne necessary for that internal wall, but I thought, why not to put it in? Um, so yeah, things are starting to take shape now. Our, our sort of shower room is, is kind of built in terms of structurally in the walls uh, and walls are going up, you know, sporadically in and amongst little jobs that we're doing. So that you can see that the shower tray is really fitting snugly there. Um, and then I just needed to build a raised platform to go up to the to the shower tray because what i didn't want was a shower curtain i'm not a huge fan of shower curtains um so i wanted a walk-in shower effectively so that we'd walk in through the opening and straight into the shower so this was obviously this section here was going to get wet and it needed to be the same height as the shower tray and there also needed to be a little bit of an angle going down into the shower tray so water can then drain off and you can see me here with the spirit level making sure that water will eventually drain off um, and then we were going to concrete over that to make that flow down to the shower uh, we decided to reuse this old sink uh, which was actually in the cabin before and we thought why not we may as well you know save us buying a new sink we've got this big china sink so um, kind of reused that and kind of marked out where that was going to be and then put drilled another hole like a drainage hole that would go underneath the cabin it will eventually feed into the same pipe as the as the shower outlet pipe as well um, and then go into the the uh, the what do you call it the soak away hole um, so you can see Faye here starting to tile the bathroom. This is the first time tiling, so it was quite a messy job, um, but did a great job. Um, so that was uh, great. The, the, sh the shower room was starting to come together. Uh, we managed to borrow a tile cutter from a friend, uh, which made life a lot easier. To, to So I'd recommend if you're ever going to do a lot of tiling is definitely get a electric tile cutter um, it makes things really fast and you can be really precise with it uh, it definitely saves some time the tile cutter was fantastic um, but definitely needs a lot of water as you're as you're going can't let it get too dry um, so while that's going on we're doing some more walls um, which is great a lot of osb was used in this build um, and decided in the bedroom area obviously we've got that kind of lofty roof 
we decided we're going to do a flat roof under that so it won't be as high but we'd we'd use that uh loft bit to basically make some storage space so basically decided to put some storage above the bedroom um here i am just putting some uh, lino on top of it of osb which is going to be the roof in the shower room it's kind of the I guess the bodge way of trying to make a waterproof roof doesn't look great but we just stuck some lino to a bit of osb and that was going to be the roof so obviously when you're having shower it gets quite steamy um, we just wanted to make sure that uh, if we just use osb obviously it's going to be soaking up all that water and getting sodden so it's just sticking a bit of lino to that and we covered the whole roof in in the uh, the ceiling in the bathroom with that there's a bit of tile progress going on in the bathroom and you can see there that window right next to the shower so that will be open most of the time another nice early morning in the cabin and this time i'm bringing in some rolls of stuff i can't remember what that is um, but yeah, lighting the fire was a daily routine at this point, as was boiling the kettle. That's the first thing you do. Um, so you can have a nice cup of tea, get some more wood, stock that up. You can start to see it starting to frost a bit, getting a bit colder. Um, and yeah, this is kind of the morning routine. It's uh, setting up the, the tables and having to think about what to do that day. So you can start to see some of the progress. This is going to be the lounge and kitchen area. And now we're in the bedroom. So where I'm standing was going to be where the bed is. And I'm just drilling some holes here for the wiring. We actually got an electrician in to wire up the cabin before um, boarding it up. So we had to figure where the plugs were going to go and things like that. Um, I didn't do the electrics myself because one, it's electrics and it scares me. Um, two, I, I was learning so much, you know, just doing the kind of carpentry style stuff that to even contemplate learning electrics was just too much. And I wanted it to be done right by someone that's qualified, that knows what they're doing. I want to know that it's safe. Um, so we decided to pay a friend. Luckily we had a, a friend. Who did the electrics for us um, a bit cheaper um, so that was a huge help uh, and definitely a weight off my mind because you know it's done properly so uh, unless you know about electrics i think it's probably worse i think it's probably one of those things that's more dangerous to know a little bit about electrics than nothing um, so yeah it's uh, definitely a good call not to do for me to do the electrics but i'm boarding up this is the the corridor there Starting to board that up and now starting to think about the roof in the lounge kitchen so we had this six by one um, they use this in farms a lot for cladding barns and things like that um, and we had a lot of this available to us and and fairly cheap um, and some of it free uh, so knew that we were going to clad the outside of the cabin in this and we thought well let's clad the inside if we've got enough so I started to do the roof um, now so for those of you that are experienced here watching this what I did with the insulation was a mistake it's actually not that bad I've since checked it and I think I've got away with it with the log burner but I've left no air gap there uh, just quickly to go off on a sidetrack here while while um because we'll come back to the roof but this is a friend of mine who's a carpet fitter saved me buying this very specific tools to fit a carpet that will that will only fit a carpet i decided to uh he was happy to fit the carpet for a bottle of wine so couldn't complain about that and he did it in about two minutes uh, much better than i ever would be able to so this is in the bedroom we wanted carpet in there because we just wanted it to feel a bit warmer and cozier in the bedroom um, so here i am doing the roof with the six by one uh, and as i put a bit of the six by one up i'm also stuffing it full of rock wall uh, in between the six by one and the ceiling now 
this was a bad move. I think, you know, what you're supposed to do is leave an air gap between the, the insulation and the roof because you want that to be, to breathe and not get sweaty um, and, uh, and damp, um, which I definitely didn't do. There's no air gap. Um, luckily seem to have got away with it, but it's not something I'd recommend. So now we're, we're um, just checking back with the tiling. Uh, luckily we had some, again, these tiles were free, which is fantastic. That's why they're a bit mishmashed. Um, uh, but yeah, free tiles um, was great, cut a bit of cost. Um, and now we're sorting out, cutting bits of OSB for the loft space in the bedroom. So that's the loft space up there. Um, and I'm really glad we did this. I wasn't going to, and you can see this is actually a shot in the loft space. I put a bit of insulation down there and then we're gonna board over that and then have a basically a, a hatch to be able to store just boxes that you, you wouldn't readily nor, normally use. Um, that, that loft storage is actually, you know, for a, for a cabin that size, we've got a lot of storage. Um, we made a lot of storage, which is great. Uh, um, definitely more than we need, that's for sure. Um, but I'm really glad we did do that because you know, some of the stuff is that that's up there, we would have had to store kind of either in cupboards or you know, other places. So it's really made a huge difference having that loft storage in the bedroom. Um, so if that's, you know, if you've got the uh, luxury of having that pitched roof in a caravan, it's, it's definitely handy. Um, so you can see the ceiling there is starting to take shape, uh, which is great. And I'm starting to put the rest of the OSB up uh, on the ceiling in the other parts of the cabin. So now the cabin's really starting to take shape. You can start seeing the rooms. This is the corridor section leading into the bedroom, coming out of the kitchen leading into the bedroom. And that door there on the right is actually the, the front door, weirdly, but we've never actually used that. Um, we always use the double doors on the other side. Um, so now starting to get to the end of the insulation, which was a great feeling because I hated the, the insulating part. I really was not a fan of insulating the, the cabin. It was very itchy work, but needed, obviously needed to be done. Um, so one of the biggest things about the cabin was the kitchen. We knew that we did not want a small pokey kitchen. We wanted to be able to have a big kitchen, which is a big ask in a small space. Um, but we came up with a design for the kitchen um, uh, that we were happy with and we wanted an open plan kitchen and uh, lounge room. Um, so a couple of shots you just saw there were just of the cabin um, at that stage. So here I am sweeping up the kitchen floor and I've masked, using mask, masking tape, kind of masked down where I wanted the kitchen to go. We had this, uh, got given this sink and, and tap, uh, which was great, didn't have to pay for that. So we were gonna reuse that sink um, uh, that someone was frying out. They just had a, a new kitchen put in. So uh, we got that sink for free, which is fantastic. And now I'm starting to do the base of the kitchen. Obviously, I've never built a kitchen before. Uh, don't have to worry about weight. Um, we did actually look at, you know, buying a kitchen um, from wherever, you know, a kitchen outfitters. Um, but because of the cabin, the way the cabin was, you can't actually see it on the screen, but the floor cabin is very warped you know the chassis below is very warped so the floor is uneven it's not level um so none of the cabin is level uh, uh you know tried jacking it up at the start and kind of leveling it out but it's just kind of came up one side and didn't come up the other side so there's nothing that is level in the cabin so if you then go and put something that is perfectly level you know, like a like a pre-made prefab kitchen unit in the cabin. It's going to it's either going to look unlevel or it's really going to make the cabin look not level, which it is. So we decided to build one and did lots of research. It's funny when you really get into something like that, you start to look at what um, you know your, your general measurements for fridges and ovens and things like that. You've all got got to take that into account. Also, really got to look at the 
the kitchen countertop height, uh, which is extraordinarily important because you're going to be spending a lot of time cooking and chopping and prepping on that on that countertop. So you want that to be the right height. And um, that was one of the mistakes I made. I, I got the height that I wanted, but because the the cabin was unlevel, I actually measured off from the 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 far end which you'll see in a minute i'm sure it will come up on a on a uh, shot here uh, just to the left where the sink is that's where i measured the height and then i was going to go level all the way around that um, but the problem was that was the lowest part of the floor there, bearing in mind the floor is not level so there is a low part of the floor um, so by the time that got round to the other side where the island was going to be kind of breakfast uh, uh, island sticking out uh, that island was actually a good uh, probably four centimeters lower than I wanted it to be um, so it still works fine uh, in the end but it's just uh, quite an interesting thing when you're when your cables when, when you're working with something that is not level um, lots of lots there's lots of factors to take into consideration so this kitchen build was probably the hardest part I mean aside from all of the research we did for the log burner this was probably the hardest part for me mathematically to kind of figure out exactly how it was going to be. We wanted uh, countertops, we wanted sinks going in, we wanted the fridge, where's the fridge going to fit? We wanted the oven, washing machine. So it's really taking, really thinking carefully about measurements, how high things are going to be. Uh, and I really wanted it to be, I wanted the countertop to be level. That was my main goal, was for the whole countertop to be level, which is very difficult when you're dealing with an unlevel floor. Um, so uh, that was, so I was very, um, uh, very diligent when I was doing the measurements and everything that I would use the spirit level constantly throughout the whole kitchen build to make sure that as I was going up everything was perfectly level um, that was my goal to have that countertop level so yeah lots of maths involved here to really trying to think and again we wanted quite a lot of storage place in the kitchen um, we knew we were going to have some shelves but I didn't want to be lacking cupboard space uh, this little this little bit here that I'm sawing out was just a um, we were going to have a, uh, a kind of clothes horse uh, for drying clothes and things like that in the cabin and I really hate you know th those sort of things I was thinking about it's like where do you store a clothes horse um, that's out of sight so I decided just to make this little section um, in the in the kitchen unit just a bit so I could slot the clothes horse in there so we didn't kind of spend all this time building the cabin and then having to store a clothes horse just out and about I wanted that to be kind of out of sight um, so that was just a little add-on there um, so yeah now working out heights and things for um, the cupboard space and like shelves in the cupboard uh, it's quite a big counter we wanted a really big countertop on the top um, didn't want anything small we wanted to you know even though we were living in a relatively small space compared to like a house um, we still really wanted to feel like we had a good sized kitchen um, with lots of prep area and things like that. Uh, we obviously knew that the cabin was uh, going to be too small to have a separate dining room and a dining room table. That's fine. So, so the counter could also double up, not ideal, but could also double up as a, as a kind of dining table if you needed to, if you had friends around and things like that. Um, so I'm using this bit of OSB here to start looking at um, putting the shelves in. You can see the framework there for the kitchen. I mean, it's overkill. It's solid. Um, it's funny actually. The you know the amount of stud walls that we put onto the cabin was really solid. Made the cabin really solid. But this whole frame for the for the kitchen um, counter was so solid. And you imagine that is bolted into the side of the cabin. Um, bolted into the floor so essentially it's this big l-shaped support which is absolutely solid over engineered um, really provides a huge amount of stiffness to the cabin because that that whole thing is just attached to the cabin um, so it's essentially a, a, a huge supporting structure to the 
to the caravan as well. Um, so there's the first shelf going in. Lots of jigsaw pieces here now, just kind of measuring, cutting out, kind of slotting them together, screwing them in, um, just to start forming the shelves and, and body of that, of that uh, kitchen counter. Um, so at this point we were on a huge rush. You could probably see the Christmas tree um to get done by christmas so this was a huge push our goal was to have christmas dinner in the cabin and at this point i think this was about the first or second of december um so only three weeks or so away from christmas day and we're at this stage it was uh, it was uh, great to have that uh, goal in mind you know a date to really push you to do some longer days to really try and get things done so here I am um, sorting out the kitchen counter this isn't going to be the finished counter but I kind of uh, initially just drilled this on just to mark the bottom of it because I really wanted that to fit tightly to the counter unscrewed it flipped it over and then proceeded to cut out that that shape so that I knew once all of that's cut out I could just slide it back onto the counter and it should in theory fit perfectly on there but like i said the osb isn't going to be the final worktop surface um, but you can see me here just sliding it back on um, and that should just fit that shape perfectly uh, which is great so there it goes back on and i'm just going to drill that in um, so yeah it was quite quick progress i think building the framework took a while because of the maths and trying to figure things out and change it as i went but as soon as that was done everything started to work out quite um, smoothly so um, before i went any further with the kitchen uh, we wanted to get the flooring in and again we used uh, six by one you'll see a common theme with the six by one um, throughout throughout the build as we start finishing things off in the cabin um, but this is quite robust and we were just we knew that the six by one was going to shrink down uh, from the log burner kind of um, over time we're going to lose the width of it so we really try to get that in nice and tight and luckily had a, a friend who helped me with that has made it very fast quick work to to lay that floor down but as soon as that floor went down, it really transformed the cabin. It kind of really started to make it feel like a home um, very quickly. So it was, a, it was a great feeling to get to get the floor down. Um, and that was going to run throughout the kitchen and the, the lounge. Um, so, yeah, really nice, um, nice milestone to get that flooring down. Uh, and again, that kind of race to uh, before Christmas. Um, and I can't reiterate that enough. It's actually a really great feeling to be able to have um, a deadline because it really gives you a tick up the arse to, to, uh, to get that build done in time. So you put in the extra work. So you can see here now I'm using scaffold planks. Um, and this is actually going to be the final worktop finish. Uh, so I've measured them out and just cutting them down now to to put on the kitchen worktop. Uh, I really knew right from the start we were going to do scaffold board um, work surfaces and probably shelves. So I think it's a it's probably quite a common thing to do, but it's the cheapest way we could do it. We found a really good deal on scaffold boards. Um, and used them quite a lot, uh, certainly for the for the kitchen worktop surface. Um, so here I am, just I've cut those down uh, to length and sort of wiped them off. And I'm just leaning them up by the the log burner. Um, I actually left those overnight with the burner running, um, just to try and dry them out. I know it wouldn't have made a huge amount of difference, but just to try try and dry them out as much as possible. Um, but you know there was always going to be some shrinkage so at this point I'm just screwing them in to the top of the kitchen work surface and um, that's going to be then in place now you know that's, that's going to be it for the work surface on the top um, which was great and we've got one more plank to go on 
the end there. So it's going to be five scaffold planks in total width, um, which is actually really wide. Um, I don't actually, it might be about four foot wide, the, the work surface. And you can see at the end, uh, there's a bit of a gap where I'm planning to put shelves. Um, so here's a couple of pans for the, for the kitchen progress. You can see you've got some shelves in there. You can see where the oven is going to go just there with the plug socket on the left. Um, and now it's starting to think about the kitchen sink and how that's going to attach. Again, you know, this is a secondhand sink, so it just uh, needed a bit of TLC, but everything worked fine. Um, I did initially think about making a sink. Uh, part of us wanted to get a Belfast sink, but they're quite difficult to get hold of and can be quite expensive. And this was just fantastic. It was a great, it's got a drip tray, really solid sink. And we were just like, well, we can't turn down a free sink. So we ended up using that. So, so this was a case of just kind of figuring out the, uh, the dimensions of the sink and, and cutting down a bit of um, ply to, to fit that uh, and then carry on the the scaffold board um, surfaces on the top. Um, so a lot of sanding here uh, on the scaffold board. Uh, they, they do come quite rough, obviously they're used as scaffold boards, so it's not a finishing thing. So it did require a lot of sanding. Um, you know, I do skim over the sanding a bit, but that was a good day and a half of, of just constant sanding. And then got this blow torch because what I wanted to do was, was um, burn the wood so initially this first burn is actually for the shelves that are the bookshelves that are going at the, the back end of the kitchen unit which you'll see in a second I just did a little burn on those I didn't want to go full scale um, but um, you can see fitting the, the bookshelves here um, again that was another thing you know I never made bookshelves and it's quite interesting you know you then start to think well how what's 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 the 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 distance the height between the shelves need to be you have to start thinking about that it's quite interesting all these little things that you think about that you you never normally would because you've got to think about well how tall is a book uh, how tall is a magazine and you, so you've got to start working those things out i did hire out an industrial sander for the day um to sand the floor because again the six by one uh is quite rough uh, on the surface so I just wanted to smooth that off because we we're going to be walking on it barefoot and things didn't want to get any splinters so we definitely had a good couple of solid day sanding um, i'm just using a bit of wood filler here just to fill in all of the the drill holes um, i didn't really want any screws kind of showing so i filled all of those with wood filler and then let those dry and then sanded them down and you can see the bookshelf there um, as for that bit and now it's a case of um, hoovering everything so there's no sawdust or anything like that and now I went for the full burn and you can see this here on the kitchen worktop now uh, the reasons I wanted to do a burn on the kitchen one is because I really like the look you can burn it as much as possible it doesn't matter because you can always sand it back to its original state so you don't have ever have to worry about over burning wood if you're trying to get that look because you can always sand it back to its original state another bonus to um, burning wood is it actually makes it waterproof when you burn wood it kind of gives it this waterproofing um, so it's a bit of extra protection for it um, but then i also used oil to oil it as well unless this wasn't any uh, very specific style oil it was just quite a cheap um, kind of gallon uh, tin five liters or whatever it is of it's just called rustic oil uh, so it's nothing specific it's just uh, an, an oil to use to so I used that on the rafters I used that on the kitchen surface and I also oiled the floor um, um, before I sort of oiled myself out of the room this was right at the end of the day i just made sure the burner was on had a good supply of wood in there so it would burn for a couple of hours just to give it a good chance to to dry nicely over overnight um, so the next day we worked on the on the bed i had a friend come around who helped me with that um, so if you remember me saying before this is actually the second bedroom which we we 
well, didn't knock the wall down, we took all the walls down, but kind of used that layout to, uh, because the second bedroom actually fit a double bed in perfectly. So we decided to put the walls in, build a bed into it, a bed frame, and we made that quite high, higher than normal probably, um, just to be able to have uh, some good storage underneath the bed, um, just for extra storage really. So um, then just use these uh, slats to put on the, the, the slats in. You can see here we've chucked a couch in now just to make it a bit more homely and we're starting to clad now the cabin with the six by one. So now it's starting to look really homely now that we've started to clad the inside and getting rid of that OSB. So we're starting to now get to the little bits of finishing touches, um, like making some pantry shelves in the kitchen. Uh, so this is as you walk in on the left hand side, it's just putting a couple of um, uh, burnt wood um, scaffold shelves in there, just for pantry shelves for what to, you know, just a little bit of uh, kitchen, kitchen uh, storage for jams and things like that. And then our bin will go at the bottom of that. Um, so that's quite a nice use of that little alcove, alcove area. Um, so a quick wash of the windows. These haven't actually been washed since we, we started the renovation. So they kind of had a bit of moldy kind of stuff here. And now another uh, log delivery for, um, for Christmas. Well, not just for Christmas, obviously, but for the winter. So uh, stack those up nicely and felt rich again, rich in wood, rich in heating. So it's really nice to have, to feel prepared and have that amount of logs sort of set up. So this is our off-grid toilet. This is um, uh, called a lavarette uh, and it's a compost toilet um, with a kind of a two-part separate, um, it's a separate toilet. So. Uh, you've got solid waste that goes into a bucket in there um, and that's got a biodegradable bag. So when, once that's filled up, you take that biodegradable bag and you put that in your compost. Um, and then it's also got for um, liquid, you go down, it, you just sort of pee into a tube, which then goes down, joins the pipes from, from the shower and the sink and then goes into the soak away. Um, at the back of the cabin. Uh, this also has a small five amp little um, powered fan, um, which draws next to no energy, which basically you don't actually need this because we weren't, um, for quite a while we weren't connected to the electricity um, and just used it as a pipe. So the fan as that is, it isn't actually necessary. It's designed just to get rid of the smells, but even without that, we realize you actually don't really need it. Um, but we, you know, it came with it, so we, we put it in anyway, but that's a case of putting that pipe out. Same as the log burner, you've got to drill through the roof and you've got to put that outside. You know, you've got a power, you've got a flashing for it on the top and you're putting, you know, that, that vent outside through the roof. Um, so now just adding kind of little finishing touches here, really just building a, um, a, uh, you know, for a long time, we're, we're living there now. This is past Christmas. We had our Christmas there. Um, and this is very much, um, you know, you kind of get used to living out of bags. So I decided to, to build a wardrobe here, a very simple wardrobe. Um, we had a bit of copper piping, uh, left over from the plumbing. Uh, one thing I didn't actually mention is, is that we had a plumber as well who was a friend um, do the plumbing. Um, it's something I think I could have learnt, definitely, you know, more than the ele the electricity, um, but he was very skilled um, and it kind of well, it obviously made things a lot easier. So um, he did do the plumbing, but I learnt quite a lot. I sort of uh, did a little bit with him and watched a lot. Uh, so that was, yeah, it was a good, good learning experience watching them do that. Um, so we're carrying on with the, with the wardrobe here. And after the wardrobe, I did little things like, uh, did a kind of little bench seat and, uh, also covered storage over the window, kind of window seat. Um, but while we're on this section, I, I do want to talk about uh, the land and how we were able to do this. So uh, this is quite a, 
um, uh, an important subject for people because we're obviously in the UK. It's very difficult. Uh, it's not a simple process to be able to get land and live on it. It's it's not impossible, but it's not easy. That's for sure. We were incredibly fortunate in the fact that um, a family member took over a farm, um, and this rundown cabin. Uh, or a static caravan was on the farm so we had the opportunity this was uh, kind of during covid um during and post covid this whole thing kind of trans transpired uh to be able to move in and well to do up not move in straight away but to to be able to do up the cabin the cabin itself actually had planning um it had been lived in before um, so for us, we were incredibly fortunate um, in the fact that we didn't have to go through any of that. Um, it was literally a case of just doing up the cabin and, and moving in. Um, so it is on a uh, on a working farm, and we pay rent. It's not ours. Uh, we don't own it. We've obviously put a lot of money into it. I think in total. The total build was um, about nine thousand um, pounds. So, some people would say, I mean, it was our savings, you know, massively. But it made outgoings a lot. It, it kind of changed our life. Uh, rent was a lot lower than normal rent that we'd pay in a flat or a house, um, and you know, we were using less power. We're semi off grid. Um, we're not completely off grid. Our aim is to be completely off grid, uh, but at the moment we're semi off grid. Um, uh, water's from a borehole, and the heating's from the burner. No other source of heating, but we are on mains power. Um, but it's definitely, uh, you know, we're incredibly fortunate to have had that opportunity to have, to have used that as our uh, a great learning, steep learning curve, and acquiring new skills. Um, so it was a really amazing experience for us um, and to be able to live like that is, you know, it's, it, it's a dream um, and it's definitely inspired us for with other plans in the future. So, um, you know, to answer a question about planning, it's yes, it's very difficult. I mean, saying that, I know people who have done it. Um, I would say that... Uh, I think it's very difficult unless you've got a lot of money to do things legitimately. Uh, by that, I mean legally. I think there is an element, and I think you know, the government make it uh, so difficult that really you have to be a bit um, sneaky, and I think you have to kind of go against the grain a bit and take risks. Um, to do things that um, might not necessarily be within the law, you know, um, that's that's unfortunately the the way things are. It's they make it the government make it very difficult to live a, a more eco friendly off grid lifestyle, uh, which is a shame. Um, but unfortunately, the way it is. Um, so nine thousand pounds give or take um, it cost to renovate this this cabin uh, it could have been a lot more expensive it also could have been cheaper as well we did get a lot of things for free there were a lot of things um, that made our lives easier a lot of things that made our lives harder um, you know when you're we used a lot of old wood um, and what you don't see in the video is uh, the amount of denailing and cleaning old wood and things like that um, which which is time consuming you know it's much nicer if you can just use all new wood but certainly with a lot of the stud work and things like that it was all old wood you know covered in nails um, and yes free and saved a lot of money but also very time consuming and labor intensive to to denail and clean and try and figure out good bits and bad bits everything's different sizes and um, but it did save a lot of money Things like the log burner and things like that obviously save a lot of money. It takes a lot of learning and research. Um, but things like you know having an electrician and a plumber obviously costs money. Um, 
but do give you peace of mind as well. Um, so yeah, I mean the whole thing's a, a huge learning curve, um, but wouldn't have changed anything about it because we've learned so much. Um, yeah, there's things I'd do differently, but we really had to make those mistakes. I think it's great to be able to make those mistakes and live with those mistakes um, so you know not to do that in the future. So I wouldn't have changed anything really. Um, I know that if I was to do this again, I'd go in with it with a lot better knowledge and maybe I did a did different idea of doing a different way of doing things, certain things. Um, but, you know, the outcome, really, really happy with the outcome and it's an incredibly comfortable place to live. You know, it's not, I wouldn't classify this as, as I sometimes call it a tiny home. I wouldn't classify it as a tiny home at all. It actually feels very big. Um, it's surprising how little space we need. Obviously, uh, you know, we don't have a family, don't have kids. So it's a very different circumstance if you had kids. Um, but for a couple, it's almost too much space. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing what you get used to. And it's amazing what you realize that you don't need. Um, and space is one of those things. You really don't need a lot of space. It's, it's certainly a luxury. But I would say the less space you have, the less crap you have because you can't, because you don't have the space for it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to be said for living in a smaller space. Uh, I'll just cut away from that a second because I hear this is one of my greatest achievements out of the entire build. Uh, I decided to try and make a, we didn't have a shower for a long time because we weren't connected to the electricity for a long time. Um, so I decided to make this bucket shower um, and made this, you know, did quite a lot of research and trying to figure out the right pieces to get and how to do it. Uh, this is a 10 litre uh, bucket, um, you know, with a few kind of plumbing bits and a rosette, uh, which is what you use on the end of a, a watering can. Uh, so we filled that up with hot water from the, from the, uh, log burner and a bit of cold obviously you don't want boiling hot water but that 10 litre can will drain out through that um, watering can end uh, for about a minute so it's actually all the water you need you basically run it for uh, about 10 seconds get wet and then kind of soap yourself up run it for another 10-15 seconds I do two soap rounds, soak myself up again, and then, then you run it for the rest until it drains out. Uh, and that's a, basically a minute long shower if the water's draining, so it's just a couple of minutes. It's a real big eye opener to how much people use water in a shower. Um, so basically what we figured for every minute, it's about 10 liters. It's actually about 12 liters because you've got more power and more water coming out of a shower. Um, so about 12 litres a minute is a hell of a lot and you think about how long you're in the shower for we actually use a, an amazing amount of water so that was quite opening but we had uh, bucket showers probably once every three days outside and it was lovely it was a really nice um, way to shower um, yeah a bit annoying if you had to work and things like that but it's um, yeah it was quite nice for for a good couple of months before we got the power in for the shower um, so now, you know, some of the finishing touches now to really kind of square things off. I mean, I guess the cabin's never completely finished. Um, there's always things to do, but um, the cladding on the outside was kind of a real nice finishing touch and something that I was really looking forward to doing um, because it just kind of sealed the deal. It was like the final package where you could just really... Um, you know, just finish the cabin and have it look really nice from the outside. So again, that kind of common theme, we used the six by one. Um, they had a lot of that and that's really great kind of weatherproof stuff outside. You don't have to worry about coating it. I mean, it's probably coated with pretty nasty chemicals anyway. Um, some would argue it's probably not good to have inside, um, but it's been fine for us. Um, but really easy to work with and very hardy you know we get a lot of westerlies um winds in the winter you know really hammering that side of that front front of the cabin is kind of southerly facing but you've got the westerly smashing it um at a slight angle probably southwesterly facing cabin 
Um, so we really do get the weather in the winter and the wind howls. Um, and it's held up really nicely. The cabin is now solid, you know, going from the start, which was a really shaky, rackety um, structure that was almost about to fall down. It's now completely the opposite and totally solid. We've been in that in a couple of storms and you just can't even feel it. It's, it's, a, it's a really solid um, structure now, which, uh, which feels great. You know, it feels great to be sitting in there and knowing that you know every inch of that and, and you've been there throughout the whole process is a really lovely feeling when you're sitting inside your home knowing that you know every inch of it. It's a, it's great to, it's a, it's a great sort of comforting feeling and, and really kind of self-empowering to know that you've, you've been through every bit. And also, you know, if something goes wrong with the cabin in any way, you, you've got the confidence there to be able to write it because you should know, you know, what, what, what's gone wrong with it because you've, you've been there for every, every kind of minute of the build. Um, so yeah, so you can start seeing the, the cladding is really starting, starting to take shape now and it's really transformed the outside of the, of the, of the caravan and we really turned it into a bit more of a, a static, uh, or it turned it into a bit more of a log cabin-esque. Um, so one of the final things here is the soak away and the soak away um, actually was one of the last things to go in um, we were waiting for the plumber um, to to kind of be available um, so we'd lived without a soak away for the entire time really um, and this was a real again one of the final milestones of of, of the build because this soak away was going to connect to the washing machine, to the sink, to the other sink in the bathroom, to the shower, and also the toilet, our off-grid toilet, um, to the liquid, you know, uh, for urine to come out and into the soak away. So big deal digging the soak away and sort of working out the pipes and things like that um, for the soak away. Um, but we got there in the end and trying to figure out what was best, you know, in the, in the soak away, what, what to put in and what not to put in. Uh, in the end, settled for um, basically a kind of um, permeable membrane um, and uh, rocks. So the rocks, so it would, uh, you'll, you'll see this in a sec, it would flow down through that pipe into this big hole. Um, and then basically line that hole with rocks. Um, well, sorry, with this membrane first. This is kind of a breathable garden membrane. So water would go through there, but slowly. Um, and the idea is that you put that into the soak away uh, and then you'd fill that with rocks, sort of larger rocks to begin with at the base and then you get kind of smaller rocks on top of that um, and the idea is the water would flow out of the of the pipe um, and then it would go into the smaller rocks kind of disperse down disperse down over the larger rocks um, and then kind of seep down in, in into the ground um, so yeah it was a bit of a process doing this but uh uh, I can confirm, you know, since using it for a year at least, um, that it's worked perfectly. We were a little bit worried about smells coming up through the pipe and then going, you know, coming up through the kind of sinkholes and things like that. But that hasn't been a thing at all. Um, it hasn't been an issue. Um, I did do a water test here where I just filled it up with the garden hose and just timed how long it would to how long it would take to drain just to have an idea um, and that worked fine and then wrapped that membrane around and then just basically covered it back up with earth just kind of filling it in um, I did have the idea we do have the, the trees in the garden are all willow which are which are very water thirsty trees so I thought you know if there was going to be an issue of overflowing water I don't think we we're going to use that much water anyway to be honest but um, just to be safe, I decided to just plant loads of willow uh, around the soak away uh, just in case there was any chance of it filling up too quickly or not draining quick enough. 
Um, and interestingly, since then, the willow that is above the soak away, um, because I kind of spread them out kind of probably about four meters either side of the soak away and obviously over the soak away. But the, the willow that is immediately over the top of the soak away has grown so much quicker than the, the willow that kind of four meters away from the soak away. So you can tell that the willow is actually doing a fantastic job at soaking up any excess water and it's loving, you know, its environment there. So yeah, that the, the willow immediately over the soak away has done incredibly well um, soaking up that water. So that was actually a, I'm quite glad I, I did that because it's, it's worked out really well, um, that willow, and it's very easy to, I'm certainly not a gardener um, and it's, willow's a very easy thing um, to get right and it's a very difficult thing to get wrong because you essentially you just chop a bit off and stick it in the ground and that's all you really have to do. Um, so here are just a few little finishing touches with a few off cuts of wood just to kind of frame in the windows um, outside. That, this made quite a nice little finishing touch just neatened everything neatened everything over um, and that is the the build so I really hope you've enjoyed that. Please comment if you have any questions at all uh, there's a lot to cover there and there might be some questions so please do feel free to comment in the comment section and um, let us know if you have any questions. Um, please check out some of the other films, we've got a lot of other detailed films on, on the cabin and bushcraft films so thank you so much and um, I hope you enjoyed it.